My name is Shahab Ahmadiyya. Uh, I'm a journalist from Sweden. Don't I look like a typical Swede? <laughs> I represent an organization called MEN. MEN for gender equality, he says here. För jämställdhet mot våld against violence. The work we do is all about communicating with boys and men about redefining masculinity. Now, when I wanted to write this speech, I started to look at other speakers for inspiration. And I noticed that they all had memorized their speech. I can't even remember my own phone number. <laughs> Another thing that I noticed was that all the good speakers had a childhood photo of themselves. <laughs> now you have to like me. You can't be mean to that boy. But it's not only for safety reasons I'm showing you this picture. I want all the men and the boys in this room to bring out that little boy inside of you. Just have him by your side and hold his hand while you are listening. Okay. So let's start in a suburb of Stockholm. A cold winter night a couple of years ago. I was with my mom on, the, on a gas station. Uh, and my mother, she seemed to have a problem opening up the gas tank. And there was this man standing across to us, an older guy, filling up his tank. I don't know his name, but he looked like a Sven. So, suddenly, Sven looks at me and goes, Ha, huh, women. And then he nodded his head with a smile, like, you know what I mean. And the worst part of it is that I knew what he meant. That nod means something. It means that we as men have an understanding and an agreement when it comes to how we look at women. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I can put this down. So I won't do that again. Now, some of us are aware of this mechanism, but most of us don't see it. We just live in it. They say that when a man gets a daughter, is one of those wake-up moments. And the myth goes that we suddenly get aware of women's situation. I don't believe that to be true. I believe men already know about women's situation. So what is the wake-up call about? I think that when a man gets a daughter, he suddenly understands that the way that he looks at other women, other men will look at his daughter. So, the wake-up call is about something inside of us. We suddenly get aware of ourselves and the code of masculinity. Now, the women's rights movement has been around for 150 years. That's 150 years of experience, knowledge, and patience. Now, let's talk about men. We recently discovered that we are men. We just found out that maybe manhood is a code and that maybe that it affects the world, that, that the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and maybe that it affects the way that we walk, talk, dress, and act, and the way that we see the world and look at ourselves. Now, we are just starting to have this conversation amongst men. Now, women, on the other hand, they had this conversation 150 years ago. There's a saying that the fish is the last one to discover the water. When I started fresh out of school as a journalist, my dream was to work on a national radio. When I got there, it wasn't what I thought, so I quit after two months. I understood that journalism is, in a way, about retelling stories. And if you are retelling a story, it has been filtered through your eyes. We all have different experiences of life, and that makes us see things from different perspectives. So we all have our own truth. My truth is not the same as your truth. And the problem is that we can both be right at the same time. So when a white middle class journalist in Sweden writes about socioeconomic oppressed areas and criminality, they are going to tell us a story about somebody else's reality, but from their own perspective. So I decided to quit. And I started to develop journalistic methods for grassroots storytelling by building platforms and giving the necessary tools to the youth so they can tell their own story. Because 
Telling your own story is about controlling your own reality. So after a few years, I got the opportunity to start Sweden's first prison radio. This was the first time I came to think about masculinity. From the outside, the story is about the beast, about the drugs, about the crimes. But from their perspective, the story is about insecurities, about feeling trapped in how the world sees you. And these guys were smart. Maybe not in solving math problems, but they have a different kind of smartness. I never forget when one of them told me, appear weak when you are strong, and strong when you are weak. This guy had been to school three years, only three years, and he was quoting the art of war and using it to describe his own reality. So they told me about a cover, about acting brave on the outside, fighting with guns and knives because the scared little boy inside was afraid of showing the fe his feelings. They told me that they have to act hard to keep that little boy safe. And I asked them, safe from what? From who? Is it your family, society? And they said, no, it's from the other boys. I was confused. So you all feel like you're playing the role of the bad boy that does not represent you as a person. But as soon as one of you steps out of character, you're ready to bully him back in line. Do you know what we call this? Crab mentality. Do you know what happens if you put one crab in a bucket? He will climb out, or well, it will climb out. <laughs> Do you know what happens if you put a group of crabs in the same bucket? They are going to stay put. Not because they don't want to go out, it's because the other crabs will pull you back. They will pull you back in the bucket to keep you in your place and to preserve the order. And the order of masculinity works in the same way. Only difference is that we can high-five each other in the bucket. <laughs> and I mean, that's not so bad, is it? To be able to high-five with your boys. From my perspective, I feel like the good guy. Maybe I deserve a high five for being such a good guy. And I see a lot of guys nodding like, yeah, me too. So I was thinking maybe we could take this moment to high five each other on being such good guys. I mean, don't, don't be scared. I, I know that we as men, we don't trust other men because, well, we know how they work, and, but it's not a trap. So let's just take a high five moment and high five each other. <laughs> you know, this is how masculinity works. That's all you have to know. Um, that all men believe that they are the good guys. And it's always a bit weird when I do this in the beginning. Everybody's so careful about, okay, maybe it's one small little one. And after a few seconds, always something happens and every guy starts to enjoy it. And they'll be like, hey, the feminist guy said it was okay. Give me a big one. So, but don't ask us what it means to be the good guy. Because we have no idea. We just like to high five about it. I asked a lot of men what it means to be the good guy. And usually the answer is, not the bad guy. <laughs> Men love logic explanations. Others who don't have the gift of logic thinking tend to have a more honest answer. And they be like, hey, I never hit a woman. I take care of my children. And you should talk to the immigrants because they are the rapists. OK, so did you guys get that? That makes you a good guy. If you have never hit a woman and you believe that you are taking care of your children, and of course, somebody else being the rapist. I mean, the bar is so low. And the problem is that we, as men, we really believe in those things. I mean, that's our religion, being the good guy. Now imagine a woman saying the exact same thing. I'm a good woman. I don't use violence. I take care of my children. And I don't rape. That's not enough. You'd be like, come on. If you want to be a good woman, there's this book on 500 pages that you can read with all the expectations and the qualifications, and hey, you better look good while you're doing it. Do you know what this means? 
This means that the world is defined by a man's eyes. We set the bar not only to ourselves, but also for others. We make the world believe that our, way, our perspective, our way of seeing things is the truth. And this is the patriarchy. We made sure to have a system that works for men, where everything about being manly in a domin dominant way is awarded, and all the feminine attributes are signs of weakness. This is a system for keeping the order, to keep the woman under the man, and to keep other men in line, because we need to have this agreement amongst men to stay in a power position. And it's a comfortable position to be in. You can be the good guy. Even though you sometimes have bad behavior, that doesn't matter. As long as the group of men have your back, as long as they will high-five you, you can be the good guy. So, after a while, I found out about this job working as a project manager with masculinity issues. We were three guys being hired by a feminist organization to do the dirty work. They gave us a mission. They said, your job is, the, is to find a way to communicate with men about sexual violence and keep us women out of it, address it as a man issue. This was five years ago, before me, I was petrified. So we objected. We said, no, you can't do that. That's impossible. And they told us, listen, we are paying you to do this. We've been doing it for free. So I took it like a man, and I went home and cried. <laughs> Starting out, we had to understand on why it is a man issue, how to address it, how to address the issue. First, we had to understand why is it a man issue. That was the easy part. In Sweden, we have around 100 cases of sexual violence every day, and 97% of the offenders are men. So, if you look at the numbers, we can see that we have a structural society problem, and that we can identify a group that's responsible. Next question was, how do we communicate to other men? That's a hård nöt att knäcka, as we say in Swedish, which means a hard shell to crack. Because you can't talk to men about sexual violence. They can't see themselves in that conversation. They see the monster. The one they read about in the papers. Have you seen the headline, Women Got Raped in Park? This is one of the problems. This headline has the focus on the victim, and the offender is invisible. He's a stranger. But in reality, most, in most cases, the victim and the offender knows each other. And the most common place is indoors, not in a park. If we want to address this issue as a man issue, we need to change our focus. What if we told the story from a different perspective and said, man raped? It is still the same story. Trust me, I'm a journalist, I should know. It is still the same story. Only difference is that the, our focus is now on the offender. And we can address him, and we can address the problem and hold him responsible for his actions. When we have the head title, woman got raped, the focus is on her, so is our perspective. We start questioning her actions. Some will wonder if she had been drinking or what she was wearing. Others will say, no, that doesn't matter, but maybe we should protect her. Maybe she should bring a friend. Uh, or maybe she should go self-defense classes. Or maybe she should have one of these rape whistle pipes to signal for help. Now let's change the headline, man raped. Remember, it is still the same story. Only difference is our focus will be on him. Who is he? Why is he doing this? Maybe he could bring a friend to prevent him from raping. Or maybe he could go self-control class. Or maybe he should buy this stupid whistle pipe to warn his victims. <laughs> this is why we as men don't see ourselves in that conversation, because we believe that we don't exist in that story. So the question, we, we believe that the question of sexual violence is a woman's issue. So we have to start by changing the way that we see ourselves and the way that we understand the world. Remember what I told you, that the women's rights movement did this 150 years ago, and that we as men, we just recently find out that we are men. We just found out that maybe manhood is a code that we are raised into, that the way we walk, talk, dress, and act is all part of this code of masculinity. 
So, we have to understand our own culture, the culture of masculinity. And we have to go back to see the programming. How did we become men? And where did it begin? So our task was to communicate to men about sexual violence. Can we talk about that as part of our culture? It goes on like that for three minutes. I, I, don't, I don't believe we have the time to watch it, okay? And this is where the problem starts. If you look at the comments on YouTube, everybody's like, oh, so cute. And some dudes are like, yeah, he's a warrior, just making a <laughs> positive connection to violence. But this is the root of the problem. When we as adults say boys will be boys, we encourage this behavior on three-year-olds. This is where the high-fiving starts. As kids growing up, we listen to stories about the prince and the princess, and the prince is always the acting one, being the hero who uses his sword to kill the monster, and we award him with a princess. You see, this is who we as men believe that we are. We can't be the monster, we're the good guys. We're the ones killing the monster. The only problem is that the monster is a fabrication. When I grew up, all my heroes kicked the shit out of everybody. It was the only tool they had to deal with problems. And it worked. Violence was a way to solve things, to get things done. But in the real world, it doesn't work like that. You can't beat up your boss if you're not happy with your paycheck. You will go to prison, and then you're stuck doing radio with me. <laughs> Hollywood got me completely fooled. They told me that the man is the hero. Even the loser, alcoholic, ex-cop type of guy that is a terrible father figure and in desperate need for some anger management treatment. We make movies of him saving the world. We confirm his emotions, which is only one feeling, anger, of course. And we show the world that despite his flaws, he's actually the good guy. He's just a misunderstood asshole. And in the end, when you have saved the world by using violence, of course, we award him with a move, woman. We award him with sex. Do you see the pattern? We are raised into a culture that encourages dominance, and we are programmed to believe that our achievements can be awarded with sex. No wonder everything is a competition for boys. This is an international phenomenon. In all fields, we are just small boys measuring our penises with each other. And we believe that the winner get, deserves to get laid. And the biggest penis stands for power and domination. And if our minds are programmed to connect that to deserving sex, it means that we believe that we can own somebody else's sexuality, that women don't have a sexual free will. Now, this is the culture behind sexual violence. But it's not only about machoism. The big muscles and the, and the violence is just one of many ways to dominate. We all have our different methods to play this, our, our part in this game. It depends on where you stand. You can dominate by having a fat wallet, a good job, or a nice education, and so on. Often physical violence is the last tool for taking power. Those who don't have any other status symbol, they have their fists. So, not being the bad guy doesn't make me the good guy, because you can even take power and dominate by being the feminist guy, standing here at North Talks preaching to you about toxic masculinity. Now this is the conversation that we need to start have amongst men. We can see ourselves in this conversation. Remember what I told you. We recently discovered that we are men. We just found out that maybe manhood is a code that we are raised into that the way we walk, talk, dress, and act is all part of this code of masculinity. And being a man, we have a responsibility to understand who we are, where we stand, and how we see the world. And to get that story, you need to dig where you stand. The change starts with me 
And if it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. Thank you.